thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Let me start with your first sentence that this is a boring topic, which I thought was a bit strange, because essentially what we're talking about here is managing globalization, right? So what could be less boring than that? Uh, so. And I'm going to take, uh, and that's obviously a very big topic, so I'm going to focus on the economic, some of the economic dimensions of that topic, and, and, and maybe as an academic have a little bit of a conceptual framework here in terms of why, why does this matter. And essentially why this matters is because we're talking about setting rules of the game that are intended to either enhance global welfare, Right, so we're trying to generate global public goods uh, along the lines of what was just mentioned, many of who, which are not economic, but which, which will have implications for economic performance, which include good governance, uh, dealing with corruption, uh, dealing with climate change. But we're also talking about things which have direct impacts on Europeans' welfare. Right? So other countries are pursuing particular policies which they perceive to be in their own interest, but which have negative effects on us. Right? So in a sense, what we're talking about to, to a significant extent when we're talking about economic governance is essentially trying to get everybody around the table to agree that certain types of policies that you might think are good for you and may in fact be good for you, although often they might not be, but they're definitely hurting us. Right? And that's very much what is the name of the game in the trade context, where it's all about trying to get other countries to reduce barriers to trade, but where increasingly the agenda revolves around trying to agree on what are the rules of the game in terms of regulation, right? And I think the regulation has already been mentioned a number of times, and that is very much what we are talking about here. Now, as we've already heard at some length, we have a number of institutions that have been set up to try and deal with these agendas. I think one of the things that's important to note that these institutions all date back to very close after the Second World War, right? So we have the Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, which were kind of conceptualized and, and agreed to during the, during the Second World War. Uh, we have the WTO today, which was created much more recently, but essentially the conception of the people who conceived of the IMF and the World Bank also conceived of an international trade organization which was supposed to come into force at around the same time. And that was never happened because the United States Congress was not going to approve it. Right? So I think we're going again in a bit of cycles. I think we now are heading towards an administration in the United States, which again is going to be much less inclined to pursue this type of multilateral cooperation. But we have those institutions and those institutions are a mix, as has already been mentioned, of entities that actually set binding rules which are enforceable through judicial types of mechanisms. And the WTO is, of course, the, the best example of that. And in fact, it's probably the only example that we have where we actually have binding enforceable commitments. And we have other types of entities where it's very much more a focus of trying to coordinate on what we do unilaterally. Right? So the G20 is, of course, very much an example of that, where essentially the name of the game is to try and get everybody to agree on a growth target. How those countries achieve those growth targets is up to the countries. Uh, you can use different instruments, and there's a process of engagement, monitoring, discussion around that, but nothing is binding, right? So I think that, that is an important distinction to make. Now, in terms of the context, uh, I want to spend just a few minutes on the context as to why this is actually becoming more important both for, the, for us as, as Europeans, but also more generally uh, in terms of global governance. And I think the common framework of this is this, this backlash against globalization that we're seeing reflected in populism, which was mentioned by Sylvia. And I think that's an important factor because in a sense what it's doing is it's undermining the consensus that used to exist that actually this type of international cooperation was a good thing. So we're getting into an increasingly contested situation with respect to the legitimacy of these types of institutions and in particular the ones that are hard. Right? So of course the European Union itself is, is kind of the best example of a hard institution in the sense that we have legally enforceable binding rules but that, that applies very much to the WTO. Right? So, but the same thing also applies to the IMF, 
insofar as countries get into trouble, need financial assistance, and therefore have to accept the conditionality that is associated with that, assistion, with that assistance. And again, that's a hard type of uh, engagement. Now, just to list six things that are ongoing that are important and why these institutions really are, are critical in terms of dealing with these types of issues. So one, we have a problem of excess demand. Post-crisis, uh, we have uh, excess demand, excess supply, uh, excess capacity with respect to a number of sectors. Steel is an, is an important one. We're seeing a large uh, kind of pressure on companies that are in these particular sectors trying to manage this process of excess capacity. And of course, that's one reflection of that is increasing protectionist actions, including by the European Union against countries like China. A second factor that is an important, again, dimension of why we need these institutions to focus on, the, on, on these questions is that we have increasingly dominant firms in these new sectors uh, that are internet related, where we have Google's, Amazon, Facebook, um, and so forth, mostly American companies, unfortunately, because that creates the impression that really we're focusing on, on one country as opposed to a particular issue. But again, there is a big question as to what are the rules of the game that should apply to these types of activities. Third example is technology and technological change and innovation. And again, that is something which, to my mind, is really what is driving a lot of the backlash against globalization. We have a lot of innovation that has been going on and that continues to go on, and that is generating huge adjustment pressures on uh, vested uh, industries, on, on employers on, and employees in these industries, and you all know the examples of the companies that are, that are kind of examples of this change. Uber, Airbnb, uh, the focus on creating driverless cars. So, so if we actually have a situation where we can have driverless cars, that means you know a lot of truck drivers are going to be looking for jobs, same with taxi drivers and so forth. So there's a huge kind of adjustment pressure that is created by these technological changes that raise the question, okay, so what should the rules be? Right? And clearly countries can do this individually, but a lot of what these industries are doing, they are global industries, they really rely on a lot of interactions across borders. They have servers sitting in different countries, we have data flows crossing all these different types of countries. So there's a lot of interactions that are ongoing that call for agreement on what the rules of the game actually are. So to some extent you can deal with this through competition policy, to some extent you can deal with this through existing WTO instruments, but we really need to have new rules. And we need to, I think, I would argue, we need to agree on what those rules are, and that has to be done collectively. Uh, the f a large part of this is really a shift away from manufacturing and into services, right? And again, that's something that has nothing to do with trade, it has nothing to do with globalization per se. Again, that, that's a function of technological change. Fourth factor, which is driving a lot, I think, of pressure on the institutions themselves, is that they've been immensely successful, right? So if we think about the rebalancing of the global economy, the rise of China, the increasing growth rates that have been sustained by developing countries over decades now, have really led to a really big readjustment in terms of economic power in the world economy. And in a sense, what we're seeing now in terms of the fight between uh, Mr. Trump and China, it's really about that tussle, right? So what is China allowed to do? Is China playing uh, by the rules? Is China actually doing what it should be doing given its economic size in terms of actually promoting global public goods and defending the multilateral kind of systems and institutions that we have? Those are the big questions that arise there, but it's really driven by, by economic success, right? And that is, of course, putting a lot of pressure on, on advanced countries, including the European uh, countries. A fifth a factor that is important here is its perceptions of unfair competition. Right? I think this is really something these institutions were designed to deal with, and I would argue they haven't been doing it in a particularly effective way. Right? So if you take the claim that you know, China is in part has grown as much as it has and is as big as it is because it has been playing kind of unfairly, manipulating its exchange rate, uh, building up large foreign exchange reserves, 
and so forth, building up these large current account surpluses that were mentioned, that in a sense is argued to be something which really shouldn't be allowed, right? And if you dig into the, the positions that have been taken by the Republican Party and by Mr. Trump's economic plan, it's very much focused on we need to start doing this ourselves, we need to start reattracting investment back home, we need to create employment at home. So in a sense, the success of that system that has been that was put in place after the Second World War in actually lifting real incomes, lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in the developing world is now being questioned and saying, okay, enough is enough. We need to start bringing those jobs back home. So again, that's a tension point. And I think the final one, which I think is very important, which has been mentioned already, is there's a perceived lack of legitimacy that is associated with these, uh, with these institutions, right? And that is translated in a lack of accountability, a lack of transparency uh, in terms of what goes on in these organizations, what they do, who are they accountable to, and so forth. Now, we don't have time to get into all of these issues, and I think that's what we have the question and answer session for, but that's, these, these are the pressure points, and these are all very important, and I think if countries go about unilaterally trying to deal with these types of issues, we're very quickly going to get into a situation where everybody is going to be a lot worse off. Now, I think in the IMF context, you know, there is this questioning of the legitimacy of the IMF, which is nothing new, right? So this is something that's been there for, for decades. It started in particular, become very prominent at the end of the 1990s with the East Asian financial crisis where a lot of the Asian countries felt that they were being forced into actions which had really very little to do with the economics of the problems that they confronted. And I think that, that led to kind of a, a perception on the part of many of the governments in that region of never again. Never again are we going to subject ourselves to the tender mercies of the IMF. We are going to self-insure, we're going to build up very large foreign exchange reserves, we're going to do that through building for basically generating large current account surpluses. So in a sense you could argue that part of the reason we're in the problem, part of the reason we have the problems we have today is because the institution really wasn't working well enough and really wasn't doing what it should have been doing in terms of managing these types of financial crises. And again, we can have a discussion about that. The WTO is also increasingly contested. And I think one of the interesting things I find about the, the, the rhetoric that is coming, uh, that came out during the Trump campaign, is that the WTO is actually blamed almost for the situation the United States, but also we in Europe are in, in that we're confronting a very large competitor now in terms of China, which is producing a lot of the goods we used to produce. And that's in a sense said, well, this is because China joined the WTO in 2001, and that was a huge mistake we made. We never should have let it happen. And that's the source of all evil. Right now, again, we can discuss the, 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 the legitimacy of that argument, but I think it is there in terms of why the WTO is becoming more contested. I think if you talk to the business community about the WTO and the trading system and trade agreements in general, they will argue that policymakers really have not been doing what they should be doing in terms of dealing with the issues that they see are affecting their ability to do business. Right, so if you think about the WTO, the WTO in the Doha round negotiations has very much been focused on agriculture and, and tariffs on manufactured products, which are very old fashioned types of issues, has not really been dealing with this new world of digital trade, data flows, services, um, and has been ignoring a lot of the regulatory issues that increasingly at business sees as something where we actually need international cooperation so that they actually know what the rules are in different markets and that they can reduce the cost of actually complying with regulatory uh, standards. So we have the WTO in a sense uh, increasingly contested, increasingly not being able to do anything and has not really done anything since it was created, I would argue, except one agreement on trade facilitation, which is again something which is uh, an important matter but not really deals with the kind of issues that, that are calling for global cooperation because in a sense trade facilitation is something governments uh, can do on their own. And what we've seen is we've seen because of the deadlock in the WTO, we've seen a shift towards bilateral trade agreements. And of course the European Union is a market leader in this area and has been for many decades. In itself, of course, it is started off as a regional integration uh, agreement. And I think what we're seeing therefore is a multilateral trading system that is under threat of fragmenting. Right? And I think 
People who are arguing that one of the things the European Union was trying to do with TTIP is to kind of try and set the rules of the game for the 21st century in a number of these regulatory areas, um, you know, people in this house can tell me a lot more about how viable TTIP is today, but it seems to me it's very much in the freezer and we'll have to see whether it ever comes back. So I would say just in a short, uh, kind of over oversimplifying, the effort to try and set rules in these areas where the WTO wasn't doing much and where we, as members of the WTO, were not asking the WTO to do much, we were trying to do that in the context of these preferential trade agreements, the mega regional agreements. That effort has also failed. And then again, this is a very long topic, but I think if you look at what the European Union has been trying to do through economic partnership agreements with developing countries, through different types of agreements with OECD countries, of which TTIP is, is a good example, but we also have CETA and so forth, I don't think it's been a particularly successful effort, right? So we're kind of right now in a vacuum, and I won't talk about the G20 in the interests of time. So what could the EU then do? Let me just come back to kind of areas of potential action, because I think that's one of the things that we were asked to talk about. I think when it comes to the IMF, I would only make two very small points, because I know that you're going to talk about the IMF. I think here the issue is simply one of implementation. So there was a process, which, uh, which I, I guess you're going to talk about maybe, in terms of changing the governance structure of the IMF, uh, giving emerging economies a greater voice in the governance of the IMF. That is a process which was agreed, negotiated, very complicated, very cumbersome, and which has not been implemented. Uh, and I think here there are two things that the European Union, as Europe, could do relatively easily, even though it's politically very difficult. Yeah. One is to give up the managing director slot and to say, okay, why should this be a European uh, job, right? Open that up to competition, let the best person be appointed for that job, and essentially show some leadership in that dimension. And secondly, I think, given that we have the euro, it really doesn't make much sense to have individual euro member countries represented on the board of the IMF, and that is a relatively straightforward way to give a greater voice to the emerging market economies. So. If we don't do this, if we don't go down this track and essentially live up to commitments we already made, uh, all we're going to do is continue to undercut these institutions that are really important to actually deal with these types of issues that I mentioned earlier on, right? So China has already created the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and we'll see more of that happening, and essentially we'll have more fragmentation of the institutions that are really should be bolstered uh, in order to deal with, with the many challenges we confront uh, today. Uh, with the WTO, let me just briefly end on the trade front. I think it's really important from a governance point of view, and this goes very much in, in to deal with the types of issues that were raised also by Sylvie on legitimacy, accountability, transparency. I would argue we need to rethink the way we do trade agreements. And I think the European Union is excellently placed to actually do that and to provide leadership and actually trying to push a new approach towards trade cooperation. Uh, I think we saw that happen in the TTIP context to a significant extent in terms of how the European Union evolved over time in terms of how it proposed to deal with regulatory differences that prevail in the transatlantic context. I think we need to do that in the WTO. Right, so independent of what happens with the U.S., independent of what happens with TTIP, I think the type of an approach that is called for when we're dealing with regulatory types of questions, which is increasingly what we're talking about, that doesn't lend itself to negotiations of the old-style trade type, right, where you have reciprocal exchange of concessions. We're not talking about concessions. We're talking about how can you actually improve how we do regulation. So I think that requires new approaches in the WTO, which will involve no longer kind of engaging and negotiating in secret. There's no reason for this to be secret because you're talking about regulatory types of actions. You need to bring in the regulators much more into that process. And I think that is something, again, which the European Union has done, and I think we can do that in the WTO context. So that's very much something I would advocate in terms of improving, again, the governance of the trading system because you actually make that a much more inclusive affair where it becomes then much clearer that this is actually something which will benefit voters and consumers. Thanks. <laughs>